we just thank you so much for this night, Lord. I um, thank you for time for Thanksgiving, Lord. Um, just a time to be with um, friends and family. Lord, I just thank you for everyone that's here tonight and that you protect all that are sick or under the weather, Lord, or still traveling, um, that you would just keep them safe and that they would just know the, um, how much you love them, Lord, and how much you care for them. In name we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, I'm excited to be here with each of you tonight. Um, the last time we were together, we covered the first section of the Bread of Life Discourse. Um, you did lesson 10 on your own, and tonight we're going to cover a lesson 11. And so this is Jesus at the Feast of the Tabernacles. So over the next couple of weeks, this section of John brings the rejection of Jesus to a climax. We're going to see the people continue to reject Jesus, starting with the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, there'll be an escalating cycle of unbelief and hostility towards Jesus, and there's going to be an increased number of death threats and arrest attempts. And so there's actually six in this chapter alone. Um, in the people's eyes, Jesus assumes the role of prophet or a predictor of doom. So this is not a complete timeline of Jesus' life. If you didn't quite um, see that, um, John is kind of, he kind of pulls in where he wants to show and um, just create understanding of who Jesus um, is. And so there's a lot of time in between our past events of the bread of life. Um, they think about six months, but some people debate about that, but that's kind of what I read. Um, this festival, the Feast of Tabernacles, are sometimes called the Feast of um, booths or tents. It happened in the fall. And so um, Connor and I are going to talk about that on um, the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll talk about that on the podcast this week. So with some background in place, we're going to look at this first part of the story through the lens of Jesus's brothers, or more specifically, his half-brothers. I'm not sure of each of your family origin stories, but I have two sisters. Usually I just say I am one of three sisters and I move on. But when people start to know me and dive into the messy of my story, they learn that I have an older half sister and a younger sister of the same mom. So when I break down that Jesus had half brothers, I just feel a little bit more connected. Um, and just for a refresher, we're talking about James, Joseph, Simon and Judas, which is known as Jude. He actually wrote um, one of the books in the New Testament as well as James did. And these are considered half-brothers because we know that Jesus is from God and his mother Mary conceived him through the Holy Spirit. And no, my older sister was not given to my dad in this way, um, but through my dad's first marriage. Um, but still, I like the idea that Jesus had this tension of a blended family. Because if you've been a part of a blended family, it can be a little tricky at times. And so Jesus is older than his brothers, and he is wiser. But I can imagine that the younger brothers, that um, they think they are wiser. And I can only imagine the brothers pressuring Jesus to go to the festival. This will be his big break. They could see his name in lights. Brothers of the prophet Jesus, a miracle worker. He'd be known and could produce more miracles, maybe even make the front page headlines. But Jesus told his brothers, no, the right time for me has not yet come. For you, any time is right. The brothers are probably a little annoyed. Here is Jesus acting all self-righteous again, like he knows more than them. But there is some sadness to this time that these brothers that had grown up with Jesus, they didn't quite embrace his claims, um, but instead they pushed him towards a role that he did not want. Because the truth is, is that Jesus is more righteous than these brothers and knew better than them. Um, but how often do we do the same to God? Jesus trusted in God's perfect timing. God's way is always right. We want to know which direction to go. The world says to listen to the most popular point of view. Sometimes it seems it's best to go along to get along. That's how we get ahead. The majority rules. So if we want to survive, we must go with the masses. But God's way quite often goes directly against the majority opinion and prevailing pressure. His way is both right and righteous. As we follow God's will, he tells us when we can and should expect pushback. But he also gives us all we need, empowered by his spirit to do his work quietly, and even when it goes unnoticed by most. For me, I can be persuaded that I need to have what others have, like the perfect home, the nicer car, and the put together life. But these needs are made up in my brain. They tempt me to not put my attention on God, but instead on my phone to find the next perfect house on realtor.com or on social media looking at everyone's perfect lives. 
Are you facing that pressure that tempts, are you facing, facing a pressure that tempts you to go against God's will? What do you need to ask God for you as you face these pressures? How do you stay strong in the Lord when no one notices? God knows what is best for my life. And no matter how much I plan or strategize what I think will be perfect, um, his will and his wisdom are better than what I can even imagine. And just like God's will is better for me, Jesus knew this. So he waited and the father told him when to go to the festival. He did it quietly and he did it in secret. He resisted his family pressure and went to the Feast of Tabernacles at God's right time. Because God's timing and plan seldom makes sense to the watching world. What helps you balance the pressures of life to stay responsive to God's will and leading? Jesus completely submitted to God's will. He acted only under the Father's guidance and instructions versus his family's thoughts and pressures. How often am I persuaded by others when I know God is calling me a different way? These pressures might seem small or insignificant at the time, but over the course of time, choosing the world's way versus God's can cause us to get off course a little degree at a time. So what do we do? For me, when I find myself getting off track, I recenter myself through prayer, confession, even confession to a trusted friend, and quiet time in the word. This helps me find my peace and center myself with God. It helps me see that he is king and his right ways are better than mine. But the Jews were not sure. So let's look at this next section of the story through the lens of the Jews in the crowd. At the festival, Jesus, the Jews were looking for Jesus. Some thought he was good, others thought he was a deceiver, but the crowd was pretty afraid of the religious leaders. So most of them said nothing. Though few deny the existence of Jesus, Many say he was just a decent, moral man who provides a good example to follow. Anything more than that is just a hopeful figment of people's imaginations. But we know that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Son of God who came to save the world. His perfect life, his sacrificial death, his death-defying resurrection, and his heavenly ascension ultimately provides eternal life to all who believe in him. Yes, he does show how we are to live today, but he is the fulfilled promise who gives eternal life to all God's children. The Jewish crowds, they didn't understand this, right? Like they just think there's this guy. And so Jesus stands up in the midway through the festival and he just starts teaching and it causes quite a stir. Can you imagine Jesus's brother's reaction when they see Jesus stand up and start teaching? They're probably like, hey, you told us that you were coming. Like, why are you here? They must have been excited. They must have been like, oh, yeah, he's going to do a miracle. And I guess I would assume that they're quickly let down because the reaction to the crowd is not what they wanted it to be. And to the crowd, he was just a man and one from Galilee, and that was a problem. So the crowds want to know, how does this man get such learning with having studied, without having studied? And to qualify as a Jewish leader, it was required that you were dedicated under a rabbi. And so it would have been known if Jesus didn't do that. And the Jews would have been impressed, but they also were probably pretty confused. According to them, Jesus lacked those qualifications and the authority to teach. Jesus knew this and he reiterated that his authority rested in his father's hands. Though this point was a loss on the Jews because they knew that Jesus was from Galilee and Jesus pointed this out by calling out the Jewish leaders from their previous interactions with the lame men on the pool, for violating the Sabbath and breaking the rule themselves. And on top of that, they wanted to kill Jesus. Well, of course the crowd thought that Jesus was deranged. Who would want to kill him? But if you remember from John 5, when we talked about the healing at the pool, the Jewish leaders at that time, they did plot to murder Jesus. So if you want to learn more about the Jewish leaders and their complexities, Connor and I are going to talk about them on the podcast. So we can tell you a little bit more about them. They have a lot going on. And we'll learn more about them as we continue on through John. So see the crowds, they didn't understand that the leaders were plotting. That probably wasn't something that was made known. They just knew that they didn't like Jesus. And so Jesus' rebuttal, they wasn't really for the crowd. It was more for the leaders to kind of persuade them. Um, he told them that the Jewish priests worked on Sabbath circumcising. So since this act did not break the law, how can making a man again break, how, making a man whole again, like he did with the crippled man, break the law? Jesus Jesus charges them to stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. And at first, I didn't quite grasp what Jesus was saying, but I liked how Dr. Tony Evans put it. 
They were used to God's standard. They they were used to God's standards for judgment. They were used to oh my goodness. We should use God's standards for judgment, not their personal preferences. When put that way, kind of makes me think about how I judge um different people. Um maybe it's how maybe it's a sibling, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's someone random at the store. Um how often do I choose my personal preference to judge others? Um, It's just a humbling reminder to me that I'm called to see actions and others as gifts of God through his eyes and not mine. Jesus' words are proactive as the crowd continues to wonder who he is. He says, yes, you know me and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him and he sent me. He came from heaven, sent by his father, to make the father known. This claim, it represents Jesus' deity. The nation's leadership thought Jesus was out of his mind making this extravagant claim. This would be um, pretty delusional to them. And they thought this was because they judged truth by their own experience and limited knowledge. They could not grasp and understand that one could come from heaven because no one ever had. How often do we limit the range of possibilities, what is true and what cannot be, by what we have come to know and experience through life? This is where the Jewish leaders and crowd remain confused and pretty set in their ways. Though some did believe, the leaders sought to silence Jesus. They tried to seize him, but were unsuccessful. The thing is, though, Jesus was defenseless by the naked eye, um, but he was protected by God's sovereign plan. The Pharisees continued to panic and sent servants to arrest Jesus, and it seemed that they didn't realize that arresting Jesus wasn't really working well. And unfazed, Jesus just continues teaching. I am with you for only a short time, and then I go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. The crowds became really confused. Was Jesus talking about going to teach other Jews, maybe the Greeks? We can interpret that Jesus was talking about his return to heaven at this at his ascension. The crowds were so stuck on the physical that they could not imagine the spiritual level that Jesus was talking about. Jesus continued to confront the confusion with the clarifying truth that he was a son of God. Only those who put their faith in Jesus truly know God the Father. The crowds couldn't seem to see Jesus for who he was. There was a disconnect that kept on getting in their way. Does this ever happen for you? You get so stuck on one minor detail that you miss the bigger picture. If this isn't you, you're amazing because that is me 110%. I can get so stuck on minor things um, like the day didn't go as planned, my hair doesn't look how I wanted to, my family did not respond to me how I expected. And I let these minor details take away from the bigger picture of what is actually important. I have missed out on enjoying moments that were full of God's joy, like some big, big moments, like my sister's wedding, Um, because I was so upset that it didn't go as I expected it to go, um, that I couldn't stop and see what God was doing was bigger and better than my little squirrel brain trying to make all the acorns fit in where I need them to go. The last 10 days, Connor and I got the opportunity to travel and see some dear friends and then spend time with family for Thanksgiving. There were multiple times where I could have gotten stuck. Late start to travel, a cranky toddler throwing fit in an airport, miscommunicated plans, annoying conversations with a family member. We can say like multiple of those. And missed wake up alarms, a not superb Airbnb situation. Um, And the list really could go on and on and on. I'm really good about pulling all those things out. But I noticed something that was different this time, how these situations were handled. Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't pull it together so fast and I did not put my eyes on Jesus and did it really, you know, made it perfectly all the time. But a trip that had a lot of ups and downs was overall a really enjoyable time because I remembered where my joy came from. God is in the business of shifting our hearts and minds if we let him. And he's doing a lot of work in my heart to not be a control freak and a perfectionist. He is continuing to draw my heart and mind to center on him when things are hard and out of my control, which they are nine times out of ten. He is calling me to put faith in him and truly know that God is my father and ruler of all. Just like God was calling the crowd to see Jesus for who he is, And so Jesus tries again on the last day of the festival during a water pouring ritual. He cries out, 
If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. So first, what did Jesus mean? Jesus isn't talking about the physical water, but instead the living spiritual water that comes from knowing Jesus and having the Holy Spirit in you. However, Jesus first would have to be crucified and resurrected for the Holy Spirit to live in his believers. And so it's important that we do not miss Jesus' promise of thirst quenching water. The same promise was given to the lady at the well in John 4. Um, Have you drawn that water? Um, Jesus issues that eternal life. And he tells us that he can simply just turn to him and never thirst again. What amazing promises God offers to us. Secondly, the reaction to Jesus' remarks, it divides the crowd again. Some thought he was a prophet. Others will argue that he couldn't be the Messiah because he was from Galilee and not Bethlehem. Though we know that Jesus was both, both in Beth- born in Bethlehem and raised in Galilee. A consistent theme in the passage has been the confused melody of views concerning Jesus. It seems concrete um, that when the spiritual leadership of people does of a people does not know the word of God, that the people will wander and be confused. And so we can kind of turn our lens and look at those religious leaders, because obviously this confusion is coming from the teachings that have been previously given. So again, those religious leaders, they're like, we're going to seize Jesus, but they're unsuccessful. Feels like a trend. When the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees, they're pretty upset. Um, But the guards returned from this failed attempt to arrest Jesus in the temple, and they said that they failed. And they said, no one ever spoke the way this man does. What amazing. God is working through these temple guards. Earlier, the leadership was amazed by Jesus' knowledge without the benefit of what they considered a proper education. What would it have been like for them to actually listen to what Jesus was saying? If you had listened, if they had listened, and how and why, um, would they have, cons- maybe they considered that Jesus was no ordinary person like these temple guards. Um, they knew that something set apart Jesus, but they couldn't seem to grasp that he was the son of God. And instead of being amazed too, the Pharisees claimed that they were deceived as well. And then Nicodemus, you guys remember him, he speaks up. Does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? But he is quickly rejected by the leaders and they claim that he is also from Galilee, kind of mocking him, and that he needs to study the word of the Lord more. The Pharisees had made their decision. Jesus was an issue and they wouldn't be willing to see him any different way. And we know that eventually that they would get what they wanted. They would kill Jesus. Um, But from now, his time was not yet. God was going to protect him. So I want to spend the end of our time thinking about Nicodemus. We don't know his intentions here, but it is interesting that he does say something. Um, We know that Jesus is worthy of our witness. And regardless of insurmountable evidence and truth that Jesus is the Messiah, the religious rulers of Jesus' day, they expressed hostility towards him and those who followed him. Everything about Jesus, his divinity, his sovereignty, his purpose, and his offer of of eternal life, they considered foolish. But Nicodemus stood up and he did push back on their conclusions. Um, Maybe he was coming to faith. Maybe he just wanted things to be fair. Um, We don't know. We don't know Nicodemus. But we do know that God has warned us that his truth would be considered foolish by the world and that we shouldn't be surprised that these religious leaders felt that way. Through faith in Christ, we can walk boldly and confidently in God's truth and love and presence to share his life. Whether Whether others believe in him is not up to us. It wasn't up to Nicodemus if the Pharisees believed or did not believe. But it was up to Nicodemus if he would call Jesus Lord. Today we can look at Nicodemus' story and see the tensions that he held during the Feast of the Tabernacle. What was standing in his way to claim Jesus the king of his life? We know that Jesus satisfies the thirsty and makes them a fountain of blessings to others. Jesus is is waiting to satisfy your thirst and lavish you with grace, love, and mercy. How have you experienced the Lord's satisfaction of your inner thirst and the living water he continues to supply? Is there someone in your life that you need to share Jesus' love with? Maybe maybe you need to sit with Jesus somewhere. Maybe you're feeling like Nicodemus and you're not quite sure about this living water guy. I hope that as we continue into discussion tonight, that you will see the beauty of Jesus and his great love for you. Let me pray for us. Dearly Father, we just thank you for your son, 
We thank you for um, just the gift that he is to us, Lord, and getting to really dive into his life and think about all that he did and just the confidence and the directness and the intentionality of his words, Lord. And God, we just thank you for um, people like Nicodemus as well that you have um, revealed to us in scriptures that we can see and think and ponder and relate to, Lord. Um, God, as we go into discussion groups, would you just continue to work and move and that we would just cling to you as we leave this place. In your name we pray. Amen.